Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, and I should also thank the uh, organizer of the conference for inviting me to be here, uh, to be at this very nice city of Lugano, where you have a lake to walk around, to cycle around, to swim in. And also, you can climb up the mountains to get a very different view of the lake. Uh, so as you can see, I'm from the National Supercomputing Center in Wuxi. We also have a pretty big lake uh, by the side of our center. Uh, the pity part is we can't swim in the lake. I will explain why afterwards. And um, also, I'm from the Department of Earth System Science in Tsinghua. So that's part of the reason uh, I'm talking mostly about climate and weather in this uh, talk today. Okay, so first I still want to spend a few minutes to introduce to you uh, the machine. Uh, I guess many of you have already known uh, the major features. I still would like to uh, go through some of the, the best parts. So first, the lake. Uh, the lake is very important. I was so excited when I learned about from Zurich, actually uh, from Thomas, that you can actually swim in all the lakes in, in Switzerland. Uh, very different from China. So this is actually the name of uh, our computer, Sunway, uh, which is uh, these two Chinese characters means literally means the power of the god, and the name of the exact machine Taihu Light. So Taihu refers to these two characters. So as I mentioned, is a is a so these two characters actually literally means super large lake in Chinese. As you can see, it's uh, roughly the same size of the city of Shanghai. So it's, it's a very big lake. And OK, so the reason that we put it in Wuxi, uh, this is the zoom out version of the lake, as you can see, is actually in history, you know, maybe from like uh, 1,000 years ago, it's already the most uh, developed uh, areas in, in China. And as you can see, still for today, it's very I should say it's very dense with all these, uh, you know, uh, cities, highways, you know, high-speed train uh, roads, and 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 as you can see, these cities. I put a list here. So similar to top 500 list in in, in uh, supercomputers, we have a list of uh, cities, you know, uh, where developed the cities in China. So these cities are all among this list. So this is, as you can see, this is an area with a lot of. Uh, economic activities going on. So one thing I want to mention here, in China, the supercomputers have to live on their own, which means, you know, you have to earn the, le the electricity and, and, you know, the maintenance cost to, to keep it going. So this is very important. I mean, we're in an area with enough industry potentially to support it and also to, you know, to benefit from this uh, very large system to, to get a cycle that can actually goes on. Okay, so as I mentioned, the Sunway is actually a series of machines. So this is uh, a little bit about the history of Sunway supercomputers. So the first uh, Sunway computer was actually born in the year of uh, 1998. Now the reason is because one year after 1999 is the 50 year birthday of the People's Republic of China. And uh, some of you might remember, there's this very big, great parade going on Tiananmen Square. And to do that, they need very accurate uh, weather forecasting. So that's the reason that they uh, built up this uh, very first system for weather forecasting services. And the second system, blue light, in the city of Jinan, which you can consider as the truest generation of type of light. So actually, these two systems, they share a lot of uh, uh, similarities, I should say. Uh, the first part is in the design of these um, um, uh, uh, cabinets. As you can see here, uh, if you have been to our center, these computing cabinets, they're actually organized as a circle. So it's a circle of uh, machines rather than, you know, normally rows or columns of machines. And the other part is about the processor. So they actually, uh, so these two generations of processors, both of them are organized as four core groups. Now, the difference is, of course, for the blue light, is a multi-core thing. Each core group only have four homogeneous cores. But for these uh, 
uh, type light where you have more cores. Each core group actually have 65 cores. So one management core and 64 computing cores. So this actually shows some more information about this uh, processor architecture we use in some way type light. As I mentioned, four identical core groups and uh, each of them has one, what we call MP, management processing element, which is more like a traditional CPU core, where you can do management, communication, computation. And uh, we also have this uh, computing core, which we call CPE, organized as an eight by eight mesh, where you have both bus, uh, buses for rows and columns, where you can exchange information very quickly among these different cores at the level of registers. So that's kind of a uh, different design in this uh, processor. Above the processor, we have very high density when we actually integrate it uh, into a supercomputing system. We call it a five-level integration hierarchy. So this is the first level where you have a, a small computing board with two processors, so that's like two nodes in our system. And then you have uh, four of them, so two at the top. We don't have the bottom ones in the animation, so four Two, two at the top and two at the bottom, so that's four uh, computing boards and eight computing nodes in just this one larger board. And then we have 38 of them to goes into this uh, super node, what we call a super node, uh, which is uh, you know uh, 32 uh, computing boards, 256 processors. Uh, the reason we call it a super node is because we actually have a customized network board sitting behind to achieve fully connected interconnection among these uh, different nodes. And above that, we have four, cabinets, uh, four of them to form a cabinet and 40 cabinets to form the entire computing system. So, okay, so this is the math for you know, over 10 million cores, how we get there and how we actually interconnect all these guys. 65 cores per core group, which are connected by this, uh, as I mentioned, row and column buses, and then uh, four of them to form a processor with the network on chip interconnection. And then we have uh, 256 of them in one super node. Four by that is over 1,000 in just one cabinet. So one cabinet already provides a performance of uh, roughly three petaflops. And then uh, on top of that, uh, so on top of the super node is what we call a Sunway net. It's pretty much the same as other supercomputer systems, a factory uh, or, uh, architecture to, to connect to all these different things. Okay, to end the introduction about this machine, I'd like to quote some tweets from uh, Professor Satoshi Matsuoka. I guess many of you also know him quite well. So uh, early in November, uh, last year, he visited our center to take a look at the real machine. And of course, Professor Matsuoka is, you know, very excited about, about uh, tweeting. So on the, second day, <laughs> on the second day, he actually, he was so excited, he actually sent out uh, four tweets and commented on this uh, system. Uh, so the first, the first one was about this machine. He said it's different from previous Chinese machines. Of course, it's the first and number one machine in China that is actually using China's own uh, processors to build it. And the second part is about the cooling, the integration of all these things, and uh, uh, which also impressed me quite a bit when I first looked at this machine. So if you have a chance, I do want to invite you to come over and take a look at the real system. Very beautifully done. We also have a lake, keep in mind, although you can't swim in it. But you can, uh, you know, sort of eat all the different kinds of fish that are produced from the lake. And also, about the software part, we support, I will talk later about the programming model. We support OpenACC to actually, uh, for some parts, you can sort of reduce the programming efforts. And actually, I like his last comment the best. He said, some way apparently plans to sell the machine. And apparently, he has made a very good prediction because uh, uh, just one week ago at uh, ISC, we actually announced the uh, Sunway Micro, which is a, sort of a commercial version of this architecture, uh, which you can customize according to your needs. 
So, if you want to order something, you can come and talk to me afterwards. Okay, so that's about the machine. So what is really behind the machine? I'd like to uh, sort of discuss a little bit about the programming challenges we are facing here. Um, so this I made at the ISC conference. I was trying to do some comparison between uh, Taiku Light and some other typical systems, uh, supercomputer systems. So on the left, we have the figure with the hardware uh, numbers. And on the right, we have the figure with the uh, typical benchmark numbers. Uh, the Taiku Light is actually this large blue box here. As you can see, the, uh, the, the advantage sort of on the uh, computing part is quite apparent. We have uh, you know, a lot more computing power than the other guys. And there's a reason for um, compute intensive benchmarks, such as the matrix, the dense matrix operations in LIMPAC, and also the finite difference of finite element methods in HPGMG. We do have uh, good results. And we are also very good at sort of performance per cubic meters, as you can understand for this uh, high uh, density integration we have just introduced. We also have uh, good performance per watt. I mean, at least it was a very good number last year before, uh, you know, PSDent with this very amazing uh, P100 power efficiency. Uh, so that's, a, that's about the good part, but also you can see we have some very clear bottlenecks constraints. If you look at the memory size, so the computing power of Taiku Light is like 10 times more than K computer. But if you look at the memory size, we are roughly the same or say even slightly less than K computer. And it's the same case for the memory bandwidth. So there's no doubt that uh, you know, we are only the third in, in HPCG solving sparse matrix, and also only the second in graph. And in both of them, K computer is here the number one in the world, which sort of shows um, the uh, advantage in, in bandwidth uh, in both memory and communication. But we did have a much lower budget than K computer. That's the part I want to mention. So, this is the system, some of the major factors you should uh, think about when you map your application to this uh, computer. It is very large, it's the first system with over 100 petaflops computing performance, first system with 10 million cores. But on the other hand, for the memory, each CPU uh, has only 32 gigabytes of memory, and the memory bandwidth is 136 gigabytes per second. If you convert that into the ratio of, of uh, compute and bandwidth, that is roughly 22 flops per byte. Okay, what does that number mean? If you look at these uh, most recent uh, many core processors, you know, like uh, the nice landing of Cori and P100 and PSDain, the number is around six to seven. So you can see in our case, we do have a very, um, should I say, imbalanced machine. machine. It is very compute hungry and very bandwidth limited. But we also have some uh, hardware differences. Uh, for the uh, CPUs, we don't have L1 catch. We have uh, 64 kilobytes of uh, fast buffer, which turns out to be a good number in a lot of, in a lot of the applications that we want to redesign on this uh, supercomputer. And also, we have this very important feature I mentioned, register communication. If you want to do data sharing among different threads within your chip, this is the best way to do it on some way architectures. Okay, so the major challenges, of course, the first one, you now have 10 million cores. Okay, when you design your algorithm, you have to keep that in your mind. And then it's memory limited. Okay. Now, in most cases that we deal with, these problems can be fully or partially solved with these uh, new features of this processor I've mentioned. But of course, along the way, you actually have to spend tremendous efforts to refactor, redesign your algorithm, your implementation, all these different kernels to achieve this uh, very good performance. So that's about the challenges. The programming model is pretty much the same as other heterogeneous supercomputers, MPI plus X. We have open ACC in the middle to sort of reduce some of the efforts when it can be reduced. And then we have the A-thread, which you can consider as the CUDA for 
um, GPUs, where you basically write your own threading instructions to control every bit of the, you know, sort of the, uh, both the computing part and the memory access part. Now, towards scaling, our approach is a two-level approach. Okay, so normally we allocate one MPI per SAS to each of these core groups, as I explained. So in the maximum case, you are dealing with 160,000 MPI processes that can be used for your scientific problem. And then uh, after that, you still have this uh, 65 cores that you can use, were uh, achieved by threading, okay, through either OpenACC or um, ACRAN. So actually, when you design your, your parallelism, one key point that you have to uh, keep into your mind is that when you design your parallel MPI scheme, you still need to reserve enough parallelism for the 65 cores afterwards. Or in most cases, you actually need to redesign. Okay, you need to redesign your aggregation to, to actually allocate that extra parallelism for, for the 65 cores in, in the CG. The second part is about the memory part, is what we do to uh, achieve latency hiding and also data reuse. The first part is about a carefully designed scheme for your specific application. So you actually, you don't, you don't want to access the memory from the main memory directly. You need a scheme to do all these different, uh, different uh, DMA operations to fetch the data from the main memory to your 64 kilobytes fast buffer, and then you do your compute. Okay, so you normally need something like this to overlap your computation and memory operations. And then the second part is about this data sharing, as I mentioned, register level data sharing among different cores. Okay, so that's uh, about the programming part. Now I'd like to give you some, uh, you know, concrete examples, especially in the domain of climate and uh, weather. Okay, uh, so, of course, that's where the climate started, you know. Uh, even with the first uh, computer, ENIAC, people are starting to write very simple atmospheric models, maybe just the two levels, and with uh, the resolution of, uh, you know, half thousand miles, something like that, to compute the atmosphere. So that's the starting point of climate models. And then later they find ocean is also to be considered. And then afterwards, of course, uh, they add land and also sea ice. So this is pretty much uh, the most normal form of a climate system model where you have uh, atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, land, and also the coupler in the middle to uh, couple all these different things. But this, is, this also kind of shows the, the way. So the model actually develop, develops uh, in the same way with the scientists develop their understanding about the, their, about the Earth system. So with more understanding, there are going to be more components to be added into this uh, system. So this is what people are trying to do nowadays. And as you can imagine, in China, the atmospheric chemistry part is going to be more and more important because we have this uh, serious smog issue that we want to deal with. And people are even thinking about, you know, adding the human part, the economic part into this. And all these are calling for more and more computing powers. And of course, people like uh, computer guys, we are always talking about improving the, improving the resolution. You want it to be cloud resolving, what was the you know, slogan that people were saying? Resolve each cloud on the sky. I'm, I'm not sure whether that is achievable, that, but that's what people are trying to do nowadays. And also, you want it to be added resolving for the ocean part. And all these things ask us for more uh, computing power. Keep in mind, you improve your resolution by uh, two times. That's already you know, at least eight times in the uh, improvement of uh, the computing amount. And of course, with the fine resolution, your physics part needs to be, some of them will get removed, right? And some of them needs to be redesigned. And examples. 
So people are nowadays running very large ensembles to improve the accuracy. So this is probably the extreme example. I just had, you know, a few months ago when we had this BDAC workshop in Wuxi, we had this very brilliant scientist from K Computer. He was doing 10,000 samples at the same time on K Computer. Now, the argument is that by doing this, he can improve the, uh, the uh, prediction of sudden rains in the area around K computer. But that's the sort of uh, the requirements from the scientists, what they are trying to do, you know, all these different kinds of uh, crazy things. So, this figure, I guess, mo many of you are very familiar with, I borrowed it from NCAR, uh, which shows these different directions are calling for more computing power. So apparently this is something that needs exascale computing capability, right? But if you look from the other side, from the software side, at least this is what we saw in China, okay? We have very good supercomputers, over 100 petaflops uh, computing power. But on the other hand, for the, for the models that scientists really run, they are not capable of taking advantage of these, okay? They are pure CPU uh, programs, and they only scale to hundreds of thousands, of course. And of course, you can see the constraints, I mean, uh, millions of lines of legacy code that the scientists have accumulated, and they were designed for multi-core, so they are not uh, really suitable for these uh, many-core architectures. So, sort of trying to uh, remove all these uh, uh, to break these walls and trying to uh, take advantage of this new heterogeneous supercomputers in China, we tried to do a few things. So the first thing is trying to develop something from scratch, uh, trying to develop some highly scalable frameworks that can actually use heterogeneous resources and scale to a much larger scale. So this work, we actually started from the year of uh, uh, 2012 where we only have Tianhe 1A, a CPU, GPU machine. So we designed, and we start from the shallow wave equation. It's a 2D equation, it's much simpler, it's where we start to trying to uh, figure out what's the best way. So we did design from scratch a decomposition scheme that can actually use both CPUs and GPU resources very efficiently and achieve a sustained performance of 800 teraflops. And in the second year, we expanded to 3D OLAR equation to Tianhe 2, uh, the uh, CPU mic machine, and with a performance of 1.7 uh, petaflops. And we even tried FPGA. We tried to see you know, what can be achieved uh, by designing a fully customized pipeline for this uh, solver. Now, it turns out, it turns out to be the, the largest challenge is actually the arithmetic part. Okay, for this simple equation, we have to compute over 1,000 floating point operations in double precision. So at that time, we don't have an FPGA chip that can actually map all this. So uh, what we did was playing with uh, precision. We tried to use a mixed precision to resolve the problem while you know, keeping uh, the same kind of accuracy that the scientists would be okay with. So by doing that, we can achieve very good performance, even compared with GPU, uh, it's uh, five times better. So this one was selected as one of the 27 significant, significant papers of FPL. And I think the even better part is some climate scientists are actually taking a similar approach to their problem, really you know, discuss about the precision, the role of precision in their scientific problems. Okay, so the most recent effort, of course, is on sound wave hyperlight. And as I have introduced, the first the challenge, how do you scale? How do you map this problem into your 10 million cores on this machine? And in this case, actually, for our work on sound wave hyperlight, we jump from, so previously for GPU, for mic, for FPGA, we were doing explicit methods. And in this one, we jump to implicit methods. So how do you solve one sparse matrix using all these different cores. So as I mentioned, uh, the first part is about the uh, MPI part. Okay, we have to design something that can actually, you know, use over 160,000 different MPI processes. So what we use is a domain decomposition multi 
great approach. Uh -huh. But, as I mentioned, when you do this, you want to resolve enough parallelism for your course. So when we do the multigrade, we are actually doing a very shallow, okay, very shallow multigrade. Well, we only have three different levels, not, you know, like the seven or eight levels people would use for multigrade in homogeneous architectures. And we also have a uniform domain decomposition, so we have this region that can be what we call plug and play for the subdomain solvers uh, afterwards. So that's the first part to, to resolve the parallelism at the MPI level. The second part, of course, is more architecture related, is about how to design this subdomain solver afterwards for this uh, 65, actually 64 CPs plus one MPE in this case. So, there are different parts involved in this solver, but the most challenging part is actually this uh, IRU part, which, as you can imagine, is not very parallelism friendly. So what we did was to design a geometry-based pipeline IRU. Our goal is we only want one single sweep of the different elements, and uh, we want it to be free of global synchronizations, and we want to improve the data locality and also uh, data reuse among different threads. So this is what we get. Uh, we have two different pipelines here. The first pipeline is similar to a lot of GPU approaches. We have each CPE to process this one pencil, one column. Okay. And then along this uh, X and Y plane, we are doing another pipeline. So we start from the one, this guy in the corner. After this guy finished, uh, the computation, it will send the results to its two neighbors who actually need its values to start the computation. Okay, so each thread will start as soon as they get enough data to compute. Now this communication is of course achieved by the register communication feature I've mentioned, so uh, in a very efficient way. So by doing this, we can then sort of uh, uh, get very good efficient utilization of all these 10 million cores on this machine. So this is some results we have got. Uh, as you can see here, uh, for two kilometer re resolution, which means we have more points, we have more compute for each thread, and our parallel efficiency is 67%. With three kilometer resolution, that's 45. Okay. And this is uh, the Golden Bear Prize of uh, 2015. Uh, that's over 1.5 million cores of uh, Sequoia. The parallel efficiency is 33. They are also using an Im implicit method. So as you can see here, these numbers are actually pretty good for an implicit approach on this kind of scale. And the other major uh, contribution I think we did last year was actually we compare, as I mentioned, we jumped to uh, implicit methods. So we actually compare our explicit methods and our implicit methods again, at the scale of uh, 10 million cores. As you can see, this uh, explicit method, of course, has a higher uh, floating point uh, performance, 23, 24 petaflops in double precision. The implicit, eight petaflops. But if you can consider about the simulation speed, sort of how many years you can simulate per day, this guy is actually 90 times uh, faster than this method. Now, of course, this is uh, only for some initial experiments on the uh, uh, mathematical benchmarks. I, I believe there's still a lot of work we need to do if we want to convert this into a real usable dynamic core, but that at least would give us some insight along the front. Okay, so that's the first part, sort of a design from scratch, something for this uh, very uh, large-scale supercomputer. The second part is actually about the legacy code. The legacy code is actually very valuable. It's developed by many you know, scientists all over the world and over the last two or three decades. But that also brings the challenge. You want to keep the scientific insights, you have to play with the code. And you know, a lot of them might still be written in Fortran 77. Very, very difficult to read and understand. So for this one, we had a project actually starting maybe even before the supercomputer was there. Uh, in the summer of 2015, we had this team with many uh, professors, students from different disciplines, 
different universities to actually look at the CSM, this Earth system model, and trying to port it onto the, uh, this uh, Sunway Type Light supercomputer. Now, the porting part is easy. You know, it's actually just to fix some compiler bugs and trying to make it run on the MP. The more challenging part is actually the second part. We try to actually refactor and redesign this CAM part to make it really suitable for the underlying hardware architectures. And as you can imagine, this is totally some different challenges from our first work. It's not designing from scratch. You actually have to look at uh, these millions of lines of uh, legacy code and no hotspots. Okay, each function is only you know, like 2 or 3 percent of total time. You have to do it all, otherwise you don't get performance improvements. And it was all designed for the previous generation of hardware, not suitable for the current generation. And more importantly, we don't have people who can understand both the climate and the HPC. Uh, we did make some wrong decision. I mean, most of the team, the 30 people we had, uh, like two years ago, were from computer science. And we had three months, you know, very intensive efforts on this uh, Fortran 77 and Fortran 90 codes, you know. And the result was, you know, at the end of the three months, only two or three of the students are still kind of willing to work on the climate problem. Okay. The others, they came saying that I'd like to jump to deep, deep learning. Otherwise, I can switch to another professor. You know, so, um, but you can understand. I mean, if you work with some code that you can't really understand, it's very frustrating. So the first step we did was an open ACC-based refactoring of CAM. And as you can see here, for the dynamic part, we did some manual refactoring, because this part is uh, written by uh, computer guys and easier to understand. But for the physics parts, we were trying to develop some tools that can actually automate this uh, process. So this is the results we get after the refactorization for OpenACC. As you can see, we can scale to the uh, scale of uh, 24,000 MPI processes, roughly 1.5 million cores, with a speed of uh, 2.8 simulated years per day. That's not bad, but just similar to what you can get on Intel. So, so after that, we, we tried to push this forward. We, we tried to do some more aggressive work. So again, we did this uh, ACE-RAP-based fine-grained redesign. So the first step is we rewrite the Fortran of ACC code to ACE-RAP-C code so that we can have a finer memory control uh, with a more specific DMA scheme and we have more efficient vectorization. And the second, for a lot of the algorithms, we actually redesigned it. Um, to, to achieve uh, um, better, to remove some of the data dependency and to expose more parallelism. So by, by doing that, we can then, so this is a figure was with the results that we get from different uh, stages. The first colon is the result of the original inter-core performance. The second one is after simple porting onto the MPE. The, the third one is after the open ACC refactoring. And the last one is with the ACE design. So as you can see here, the starting point, MP maybe one tenth, one third. As you can imagine, all core is much simplified. And after refactoring, we can be equivalent or even better than one single intercore. Only after this redesign, you can really get the computing power equivalent to, you know, seven or in some cases forty intercores. So that's really the performance you can get through. Redesign. And this is the scaling results. I guess this is probably the first time that we can scale you know, the uh, dynamic core of an existing model to the scale of uh, 8 million cores with a performance of 1.6 petaflops. So I guess I'm probably running slow here. So uh, for WARF, it's kind of similar, as you can imagine, uh, similar challenges that we are facing here. And uh, on top of all this, we did for CAM. We also derived a performance model to actually guide our uh, uh, performance optimization afterwards. Consider about the uh, parallelism in compute, parallelism in memory operation, and the, the, the extent that you can actually overlap these two parts 
to estimate the performance that you are getting in the very end. So as you can see here, the first two figures shows the actual performance versus the predictor predicted performance. So as you can see here, this model is actually getting some very good results. And the second one is about, in certain cases, you may not want to use all the 64 CPEs. So in some cases, by using a smaller number of CPEs, you can actually get away with better performance. And this is the uh, sort of the uh, speed up uh, performance we can get. The comparison is comparing 64 CPEs against the one MPE. As you can see, most uh, of them are around seven or eight. Only for compute intensive parts, you can get somewhere around 14. Now, again, for this part, is still at the stage of open ACC based refactoring. Okay, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the long-term plan. As I mentioned earlier, in China, the supercomputer centers are not easy. <laughs> they have to earn their own money to support the electricity and the stuff and, and things like that. So the first part is that we're trying to convert the science into service. As I mentioned, the climate weather forecasting, and we also did some work this year, um, earthquake simulation. So these things we want to work with the national agencies and trying to sort of uh, promote them from scientific uh, discoveries into some services that can be used by the government. Of course, then we can ask them for money <laughs> to support this, uh, this uh, machine. And the second part is deep learning. So uh, starting from late last year, we were de developing this uh, framework. The first one is what we call a Sunway DNN. It's the uh, uh, low-level parts with high-performance uh, uh, computing functions for the convolutions. The second one is what we call a Sunway Cafe. It is trying to sort of improve the uh, scalability of uh, training really large problems. And this is the performance so far, as you can see. Uh, currently, we are getting uh, 3.5 times equivalent performance to um, 24 inter cores by using one uh, uh, core group. And the last part is, of course, Sunway Micro. So if any of you <laughs> might be interested, please come to me afterwards. So acknowledgments. Uh, Ministry of Science and Technology which supports this uh, machine and also a lot of the software projects. And RCPC, who actually made this very beautiful machine. And I also would want to thank uh, the friends from NCAR and SCAC who are helping us with the CAM and also the uh, Earth simulation work. Okay, with that I should say thank you. And, uh, Especially, I should thank the organizer. This is the view I had yesterday from the top of the mountain. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Fu, for this very interesting and inspiring talk. Um, I guess we have questions. Uh, please use the microphone. And <clears throat> Thank you for this very nice talk and overview. Uh, I would be interested in your plans on the memory rate. So this 22-byte uh, per flop is, of course, outside of many of, of mm -hmm. the applications that we're targeting. Mm -hmm. So what are your plans? And concerning your Sunway mm -hmm. Micro, what will be the future of these plans? The future is uh, we had this argument, actually, with the hardware teams from time to time. So actually, they know all the constraints of this current architecture, and they know all the pain <coughs> you know, the software people are having because we are arguing with them at least twice a week, something like that. So, but now it is a budget thing. You know, you only have this one processor. And keep in mind, I think our technology is probably, you know, one or two generations behind. So with this one processor, you want to fit in the computing power as well as the memory things. So I think that that was the reason why they decided they didn't use a much higher bandwidth or, you know, uh, air one catch for the CPEs. Uh, for the next generation, uh, as far as I know, at least the buffer is going to be doubled. And maybe there is going to be some kind of catch facility, but we don't know for sure yet. Uh, the bandwidth, of course, they are starting to look at the uh, stacked memory things uh, similarly to other architectures. Right. Okay, is there one more? 
Please raise your hands. Yeah, there's one question. Uh, hello. Th thank you for those very impressive results on CAM and WARF. And my question is about precision. Uh, what sort of constraints or restrictions did you have on precision, and what were your observations for that? Uh, well, actually, in these two projects, we didn't play with precision that much because uh, that's actually one constraint of Sunway architecture for now. We focus too much on double precision. <coughs> So if you switch to single precision, we don't have uh, too much performance benefits. So uh, in these cases, we are just uh, using double precision for CAM, and in most cases, single precision for warp. OK, so yes, one more question. Yost. So I have a question on your software refactoring efforts. You have put mm -hmm. a, a very large team of 30 people working for many months on the code. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the next architecture, is this work lost? And in this context, would it be in interesting to have, for example, a DSL for this dynamical core that could be just retargeted to a new yes. architecture? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, we are trying very hard to actually push students to move the efforts from the specific application towards tools or even compilers. But you probably understand how hard it is to persuade a student to work on compiler, you know, <laughs> things like that. But that's, that's actually our plan. I mean, after all these uh, results, we would want to convert them into actually a tool that can benefit other scientific applications as well. OK, so one more question. I cannot see anyone. So in this case, let us thank again Professor Fu for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.